بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والعاقبة للمتقين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أما بعد uh, I would like first to thank the brothers uh, who are here today uh, for coming and putting effort to listen to this mashallah there's many people here May Allah Azza wa Jal reward you and bless you all and obviously for inviting me. You know, it's my first time in the Netherlands, but mashallah, people are very hospitable. And I like like this, that there is a Moroccan community, you know, because Moroccan people have a special place in my heart, you know. So I love, alhamdulillah, there's a big uh, Moroccan community here uh, in the Netherlands, inshallah. It's not going to be the last time that we're here today. And the topic of today, inshallah, is going to be about the situation, the state that the Ummah is in and uh, specifically the people who live in the West. So uh, what I'm going to be talking about will also concern people who don't live in the West, right? Because the diseases of the Ummah, they tend to be the same diseases and they tend to be a common diseases. Meaning that these diseases are not just uh, when one land and the other land is free of that disease. Rather no, that disease is influencing this Ummah here is influencing the Ummah somewhere else as well. So it will also be concerning anyone who is a Muslim who lives anywhere. But it's essentially and initially, it is the people who live in the West. If you live in the West and you live among non-Muslims, uh, the things that we will be mentioning today will concern you a bit more than it would concern other people. Now, the first thing that I want to, uh, to mention and talk about, inshallah, is that the idea is that problems that a Muslim encounters in this dunya is two types. The problems that we encounter as Muslims in this dunya is two types of problems, right? Two types of fitan. Fitna in the Arabic language means a trial and tribulation. We have the fitna of shubuhat and the fitna of shahwat. Fitna of shubuhat is, a, is the fitna of doubts, right? When you have a doubt, you, come in, uh, you encounter a doubt, a problem, uh, something problematic that you, you do not know how to answer. People talk to you about Islam with some questions that you're not familiar with. So this is the first thing. The fitna of doubts, shubuhat, the people teach you deviancy, they give you misgu misguidance. And the second type is shahawat, desires. You know, all humans have desires and men have desires, women have desires, Muslims have desires, and these desires lead them to doing what? Sins. So the other problem, other type of problem is sins, the sins that you do. Someone drinks alcohol, someone commits zina, someone doesn't pray, some, these types of, of problems. And which one is actually more severe for Muslims? It is the fitna of shubuhat. Why is the fitna of shubuhat, the fitna of doubts, more severe than the fitna of, of shahawat and desires? It is because the fitna of shubuhat leads the person to leaving Islam. The per person encounters a doubt, especially in these days and uh, in this day and age, living in the West. You are the Muslim. You go to the university. You you find in the university is free mixing, right? Men with women. And if you do not engage in that free mixing, what do you become? You become the alienated individual, the person who is like a stranger. Why are you doing? Everyone else is free mixing. They were looking at you like a stranger. Why are you not doing the same thing that everyone else is doing? The woman sh puts her hand to shake your hand in the, in the university. Or not? Oh, we've got a big issue now. Should you shake your hand and compromise your deen and religion or be labeled as the Muslim extremist, quote unquote Muslim extremist? Why are you extreme? Because you... How can you not shake the hand of a woman when she put her hand? Do you, you think she's less than you? Obviously, that's their understanding. If you don't shake hand, therefore, the, you're inferior. So, as a Muslim, you tend to come across these problems, right? You feel alienated. And then in the university or in your workplace, the same problems. You're not able to shake hands. People are mixing. People are eating food. They're talking about certain things that opposes your religion. And you, not only that, when you go to university, when you are uh, listening to professors and teachers, they intentionally want to instill doubt within you, especially the students, whether it is in school or university. In the Western community, if you put your children in school, then be prepared that one day, if you put them in a mixed disbelieving school, be prepared that one day they might come to you and say, I'm not Muslim anymore. They will come to you and tell you, I'm not Muslim anymore. I have met me personally doing da'wah, I've met a child that is like was roughly from seven to eight, nine, zero, uh, nine, uh, eight or nine years old. You know what he said? Uh, he said, I'm an atheist. I was like, what? 
seven year old child, the kid is like this, is like you barely can see him. And I said, he said to me, I'm an atheist. And you know, he didn't just say I'm an atheist, not understanding the meaning of what he's saying. This is the problem. He didn't just say I'm an, because you know, you can be a child, you hear a word and you repeat the word. But he didn't just say I'm an atheist. That child, in fact, I asked him, what do you mean atheist? You don't believe there's a God? He said, yes, I don't believe there's a God. Then I said to him, okay, there's a table here. Where did this table come from? Did some, didn't someone make it? How, who made the universe? He said, no, no, I'm an atheist. And he, and he uh, became, uh, his, his face changed and he left and he hid behind his mother. Can you imagine? He is not just an atheist. He is someone who firmly believes in his atheism. The kid is seven years old. Now, I want to ask you this question. To be people who have children here, if I get your seven-year-old son, would he respond in the same way about being a Muslim? If I were to question him about the teachings of Islam, and I were to, to, uh, to tell him, are you Muslim, you're sure, and ask him some questions about Allah, would he get upset that I'm questioning him about his beliefs, and then turn away and move away from me? If the answer is no, then we have a huge uh, problem today. We have a huge issue. This is, by the way, what I've not told you in the story. Do you know what I've not told you? He was the son of someone who was a Muslim. This is not a son of an atheist. I'm not giving you a story. Of, this is a real event that happened a few weeks ago. He even tweeted about it. This person was a Muslim. But do you know what happened? He was married to a non-Muslim woman. He was married to a non-Muslim woman. Quote, unquote, Christian. And we'll come to this idea, inshallah. He was married to a non-Muslim woman. One daughter, he had the other, the elder daughter was like, I don't know, 10, 11 years old, or roughly this, not much difference. And she said, I don't know, I'm agnostic. So a Muslim father married to a non-Muslim woman with an atheist child and an agnostic daughter, 10 years old, at 10 years old. This is the, this is the fruits that some Muslims are producing in the West. So if you're living in the West, this is some of the fruits that Muslims are producing. They're producing next generation of atheists and agnostics that come to me on the same da'wah table and, and engage with me, debate with me about why atheism is the truth and why Islam is false. And these are the lineage of Muslims. So we need to know uh, what is happening. We need to know what, why are these things happening. This seven-year-old child, no one can come and tell me he came to that conclusion in, on his own. You know, a seven-year-old child happened to come to the conclusion that atheism is the truth and that there is no God and the table came from nothing. No, his teacher in the university, his teacher in the school, his teacher in the kindergarten have taught him these values. I have another friend and that friend, his wife came with one of her children and her daughter, she goes to the kindergarten and she was saying, Jesus died for our sins. I was like, what's going on here? <laughs> what's happening here? And then she's debating the argument. No, no, actually Jesus died for our sins. These are things that are being taught to children today. This, these are some of the diseases that are inflicting this ummah today. So we said fitna of the shubuhat and fitna of the shahawat. So the fitna of the shubuhat, why we're saying is more dangerous is because of what I'm telling you. You're putting doubt in the hearts of someone, whether it is about the truthfulness of Islam, whether it's about God's existence, whether it's about any topic, whatever the topic is. You're putting doubts in the, in the heart of that person and that person ends up being an atheist, a Christian, a Jew, whatever it is, he leaves Islam. That is why, and the, and the outcome of that is what? Is eternal hellfire. This is something that, there is no compromise here. The, the outcome, the end result of someone who doesn't follow the teachings of Islam and die as a Muslim, he doesn't die as a Muslim, he ends up in hellfire. That is why that fitna is more dangerous than committing sins. We're not saying you can commit sin in, uh, as a Muslim in the West, yeah? But we're saying what is more dangerous, right? Now, so let's mention some of these problems, some of these, uh, first, the shubuhat of doubts. One of these things that are most prominent today, Muslims are facing, not only in the West, by the way, and this, as I said, is focused on the West, but the reality is what happens in the West is by extension for uh, influencing everyone else in the world. Because of social media, because of what people watch, etc. So it's influencing everyone. One of these doubts that they put forward is the idea of liberalism. I'm sure you all heard about the idea of liberalism or the name liberalism. If you understand it or not, it's a different topic, but you heard the idea. One of these most common doubts is liberalism. They say to you, you are free. Okay, I'm free. Yeah, you're free to do whatever you want. Okay, is there any exceptions? Yes, you cannot harm another person. That's it. So I can do everything, whatever I want. If I don't, yeah, yeah, yeah do whatever you want. 
You are free. You're your own person. You can do whatever you like as long as you don't harm anyone else. Now, this is the idea of liberalism that unfortunately Muslims have adopted. Muslims have adopted. Now we're talking about the disease of the Ummah. Yeah? We're not talking about the beliefs of the West. We're talking about the beliefs of Muslims. Today, Muslims come on the da'wah table. You engage with the Muslim. You speak with the Muslim. You ask him, how do we know right from wrong? He says, as long as you don't harm anyone else. What did you do to others as you like done to yourself? Right? These statements and sayings. It's all saying the same thing. And where did they get this from? University, school, uh, colleagues, non-Muslim friends. Friends, quote-unquote. Right? And they end up coming to you with this ideology now. And that is why you see them more lenient with, with certain th things, right? They're more lenient with uh, rainbow flags and people with rainbow flags. They're, they're more lenient with the, things like this. Why are they lenient? Because they've adopted the ideology. They, you know what? There's no problem. Let's, we can say to, to them, happy Christmas, you know, happy holidays. It's, it's okay. You know what? Do to others as you like that. No one is hurting anyone, you know? You know what? This guy becomes an atheist. Why you punish him? Why Islam has a punishment for the guy who lives in Islam? What are you talking about, man? Like, you know what? Do to others as you like that. He's not harming anyone. At all. He's just he's spreading doubts in the hearts of Muslims. Nothing else. He's just like, it's very simple. He's not doing anything else. So Muslims have adopted this ideology. The ideology of you can do whatever you want as long as you don't harm, harm anyone else. Even though we, we ourselves know that in reality, even they themselves don't follow this, this rule. Because there are many things which are harmful, which they don't forbid. In their countries. Do they forbid alcohol? Don't they agree that alcohol is one of the main causes of cancer? Gives you cancerous cells, kidney failure. They will tell you, yeah, of course. Isn't uh, uh, having, dealing with gambling a big problem in the society that causes people to become homeless and murderers and rapists and, and thieves? Yes, yes. Do you forbid it? No, no, no. We don't forbid it because we mean harm as an individual. We don't mean harm as a society. So this idea of liberalism is a selfish idea. It's the idea is me. Me before everyone else. Is it harming me? No, then it's okay. Okay, but it's harming everyone else in the community. Ah, yeah, that's a different story. As long as it's, harm, it's not harming me, it's okay. And you find certain things that it's not harming anyone, but they will say to you it's wrong. And a common example of that, even though we don't have to give this example, but we can give this example. You will ask one of them, Okay, two people, brother and sister, and you want to have intercourse. Or brother and brother. You want to have intercourse with each other. Yeah? Why is that wrong? You say, yeah, it's disgusting. Okay, but disgusting, is it against the law? Why is it against the law? Why is it wrong? Your rule, you just said to us, do to others, like done to yourself, and as long as you don't harm anyone else, you're fine, and they're doing it by themselves, right? Why is it wrong? No, no, it's just, this, this is it's too far. So they have red lines, but those red lines that they use is not even in accordance to the rule. So the rule is depending on what they think, what they like. Okay, this is okay. You know what? This is tomorrow. This might be okay. And you know, you have in certain parts in America, they try to find, to try and to legalize incest today. They're trying to legalize it. Yeah. So uh, no one can say because you know they have their argument. Love is love. You know, love is love, and we're not harming anyone else. Same arguments that other people are using. They go to the court and they say, you know what? Love is love. I'm not harming anyone else. It's just my brother. And he's my brother. Look, we're not going to have any children. So don't say to me, deform children, even though you can use contraceptions. You don't, have, you don't need to have a children with a woman. You can avoid it. But we're saying brother and brother, so they don't play this game, right? And they go, they say gay rights, and love is love. And I'm not harming anyone else, you know? And they have a very strong case, isn't it? According to your liberal values, they have actually the strongest case. You have no actual reason in which is reasonable you can use to say that this is not okay based on your rule. Okay? But we have Muslims today ab adopting this idea, right? Even though you see how problematic the idea is, and you see how this idea is not even being, influenced, uh, is not even being implemented by those own people who adopt it, but you have naive Muslims who left the teachings of their own religion and adopted this idea of, of liberalism. Another idea is what is feminism? Is what? Feminism. What is feminism? Yeah, we are equal, we're independent. Remember the shake in the hand, yeah? Yeah, coming back to the shake of the hand. If you don't shake my hand, then you don't see me as an equal. If I'm not your equal, then you are misogynistic. You know, you, you're a woman-hating bigot. That's why you are. Because, you know, you don't want to shake my hand, you know. The majestic hand. You don't want to shake my hand. So, they have this idea of feminism, which effectively says the men and women are equal, and they should be treated the same way. There shouldn't be any difference in treatment. Okay, but don't you agree with me that men and women 
are physiologically different. Yeah, 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 they're different. They're not the same. Like um, a woman becomes pregnant, according to us at least, because some of them be believe men become pregnant. So it's a different story, yeah? But in common sense, women become pregnant and men don't become pregnant, right? They have maternity leave. Like they have a menstrual cycle. That menstrual cycle t takes a specific period of time. Men do not have a menstrual, menstrual cycle. Uh, they, their, their psychology works differently. And these are all established scientifically. And they themselves, through their own uh, published works, they will, they will say to you, yes, of course, we are psychological. Even the founders of feminism, Simone de, Beau de Beauvoir and all of those people who are the, the founders of the first movements of, uh, of feminism, they will say the same thing. They will say, we admit that men and women are different, biologically and psychologically, but they should be treated the same. Okay, so how would you treat two different things the same way? Is that, how is that just? How is it just? If he has four children and you have two, and I give both of you 200 pounds, it's equality. But because you're different, your situation is different, it's not just, right? Teaching a person who's 50 years old quantum mechanics and teaching a 10-year-old quantum mechanics is equal, but it's stupid because one understands what you say and the other doesn't understand you. They're different. They have a different capacity of intellect and understanding. So because they're different, giving them the same treatment is just ignorant. But then, what is the reason, why the reason, what is the reason they brought feminism to begin with? It is because they wanted uh, women to go into the workforce. Because when you have men and women going into the workforce, you have double the money coming, right? Instead of just one income coming, it is double the money coming. And it's because women are the majority of consumer, uh, consumers, they buy things more than men buy things, you know? They're more interested in these, in buying outfits, buying clothes, buying dec decorative decorations and all of these things. The more money they have, the more they're going to spend, right? So, why, why do you only have one household where the man is the provider and a woman is home raising the next generation? No, 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 no. We want both the men and women to work. And then we'll tell them that you're both equal and you're just a prisoner home. Because you're a prisoner home, we're going to free you. How are you going to free me? Take your clothes off. When you take your clothes off, you become free. So take your clothes off and then go to work and then say to the man, you don't dare to speak to me. Every man, no, 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 your boss, you have to listen to what he says. But your husband, you say, look, we're equal. But the boss, yes, yes, sir. One cup of coffee, there you go. So you listen to your boss, but you don't listen to your husband. And you become equal because your boss is important. He's the one who's going to give us the money, isn't he? You have to listen to the boss. We want you in the workforce. You've got to listen to your boss and do as your boss says. But your husband there, he's just controlling you, keeping you a prisoner. Don't listen to him. Take your clothes off and go to work. And then... This stupid ideology, as you're laughing at right now, is the ideology that Muslim women have adopted. Not all Muslim women, of course, not all, but many Muslim women. They've adopted this stupid ideology, in which now they tell you, I don't want to get married. Because in Islam, you know, you're not going to commit zina. So you, you, would, I, you shouldn't get married. I don't want to get married. Why you don't want to get married? I need to work on myself. Find myself. What do you mean find yourself? No, I, I, did you get lost or something? No, no, I'm going to find myself. How are you going to find yourself? Like you're in front of me here. No, no, I'm, I need to find myself first, become educated and experience life, and then have my degree. Why do you want to have your degree? I want to have my degree because maybe one day divorce will happen. And what am I going to do when I get divorced? So you're getting married the intention of divorce. Uh, kind of, yeah. So why do you get married to begin with then? If you're getting married the intention of divorce, what's the point? So they come with this idea. They say to you, you know what? No, we're equal. I'm going to be educated and smart and find myself and spend years in university. And this is true freedom as a woman. And then become miserable later on when, when no one wants to marry me. But they don't, they don't mention that part. That part is, is not important for feminism, right? So you have Muslim women adopting this ideology, right? This is a stupid ideology as we can see. Because it ends up happening. Well, you can look at the West if you don't believe me. It's a stupid ideology. Look at the West. Highest rates of divorce. Highest rates of depression for women. People are barely getting married anymore. I don't need to prove this, right? This is a fact. Just look at the stats in any country. The government stat itself will tell you. Divorces are happening, increasing. Women are more depressed than ever. And I mentioned studies before. I mentioned studies multiple times, like Blanche Flower and Oswald, which is a study done from the 1900s, 1970 or 60, or to, to 2000s, since the start of the movement of feminism. And they say women are depressed, less well-being than ever. They're not happy about their lives. They're committing more, are taking antidepressants, committing... Uh, self-deletion and all of these things. So they're not happy. So even though we know they're not happy, but women, Muslim women, are adopting this ideology, right? 
What other things do we have? Within the Muslim world, we have division. And division is a tactic that the West have always used. Divide and conquer. Right? Divide and conquer. We have many Muslim uh, the example is the lands, is a basic example that Muslim people know. The Islam, certain lands that was one country becomes multiple countries, and Maghreb al-Arabi becomes Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, and Mauritania, and everyone has his own flag. Flag, you know, I don't know where this flag comes from, but you know, you have a flag and you wear your flag and you're prideful with your flag as if it's going to take you to Jannah or something. And you know what? If you, if you speak badly about my country, you're an evil pe pe person. Even if you're a Muslim, you don't dare to speak about my country. Nationalism before Islam, you know? Nationalism first. My people first before anyone else, you know? I'm a nationalist before a Muslim. We have division because of this idea. Then we have division because of people from misguidance, people who are ignorant, got people coming on social media. Guys barely was wearing diapers yesterday. And he goes on, on YouTube and he starts telling you, you know what? Actually, you don't need hadith anymore. Uh, an example. Brother, but like 1,400 years we've been following hadith. What's going on here? Did you find this? How did you? I found this marvelous discover, discovery when I was reading the Quran. What happened when I was reading the Quran? I came to this enlightenment. But the Qur'an is the only thing we need, mashallah. What this verse here and this verse there means that. And this hadith is just fabrication. But what about 1,400 years of scholarship? Those people did not have your enlightenment? What, they couldn't read the Qur'an or did they know Arabic language or what? Prophet what's what's going on? What was going on that since all of this 1,400 years until you were born yesterday? You know, Ummah was Ummah's guidance. And the ulama are all evil and the scholars were all sellouts. And no one is guided except me. And my way of how to pray, which every... One who rejects hadith has his own way how to pray, how to perform Islam. My way is the right way. So you have to follow me and no one else. And he starts causing division. Yeah? You get another person who starts calling Muslims. You might have heard this. This, this guy is a sellout. This guy is an agent. This guy is this. This guy is a Wahhabi. This guy is a Madkhali. This guy is a Ikhwani. This guy is... And you start labeling people. One by one. And causing more division within the ummah. And you got people of misguidance. It's true. There are people of misguidance. No one is denying this reality. But when in day and night your job is to just cause division by labeling and naming people, of course you're just causing division for the sake of division. You're not trying to actually find the truth. You're not trying to unite the people upon the truth. We're obviously saying you unite the people upon the truth. You cannot unite upon falsehood. If someone is believing falsehood and believing truth, we cannot unite. But still, there is a way of advising. There is a way of coming closer to unity. And that is not calling each other names and, uh, and uh, saying that every person is a sellout, is working for the, the Yahud, and this person is working for the CIA, and this person has been getting paid for this person. Yeah, where's your evidence? No, I'm just saying it. You know, look at him. He looks like it. You know, I saw it in his face. That's your evidence? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah well, 10,000 years ago, he visited uh, USA. So he works for the Mossad. Brother, what's going on? You have these people creating separation and division. You got other people, okay, and this is me now being clear about this. No one is saying that the Arabic countries today have fulfilled their duty, are fulfilling their duty towards what's happening in Palestine. No one is saying that. If you say that, you're lying. Because we can see our brothers and sisters are being persecuted. We don't see armies going there fighting, right? But then it becomes a problem when you have someone who day and night just speaks about the Arabs. He doesn't even talk about specifically leaders. No, no, he says the Arabs. Wasn't the Prophet Islam an Arab last time I checked? Was he an Arab or no? Was the Sahaba Arabs? Were ma many of the majority of the ulama Arabs or no? They were Arabs. Well, are there Arabs today, ulama, major ulama, who teach the people the religion or no? So what is this Arabs are this, Arabs are that, and pictures of Arabs wearing Arab clothing? And that's why you see me today, you know? I'm ready. Okay? So they can label me. So... You Arabs this, Arabs that. Okay, brother, we agree. We already established this point. We said, whoever claims that they fulfilled their duty and whoever claims that there is no issues is lying. Whoever claims there is no issues are lying. But the issue of Palestine is an Ummah issue. Is it an Ummah issue or not? Or is it just an Arab issue? Is Islam Arabs or is Islam a Muslim Ummah? Someone says, you know what, but the Arabs are closer to Palestine. Okay, the Arabs are closer, but there are countries that are not Arab close to Palestine. Isn't Turkey close to Palestine? Is it Arab? It's not Arab, it's very close to Palestine. Just, you don't have to be an Arab country, right? Point is, this is the issue of Ummah that creates division. What happens then? Then you get the Arabs, who are nationalists, we just mentioned nationalism, right? They are fighting back against them now, right? 
And they, even they will, if they will say falsehood, they will say falsehood to fuel that division that is taking place, right? So more division takes place. When we are in need of what? In this time, what do we need for Palestine? Do we need division or unity? Do we need to point, point fingers at, at each other? Or do we need to unite as an ummah upon the truth? We need to unite. But they just fuel more division between individuals. This group versus this group and these people versus these people. So another division that we have in this ummah, right? Okay, so that's another problem. And obviously, the doubts, the general doubts that atheism brings, that, which stems from what we've already spoken about. Stems from liberalism and feminism, right? Specifically, most likely, liberalism when it comes to uh, doubts that usually takes people out of religion, but also feminism. Because feminism has a aqidah now. Has its own aqidah and creed, you know? And that aqidah of feminism and creed have made many Muslim sisters disbelievers. Because they have disbelieved in some verses in the Quran. Marrying four wives? No, 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 you're misunderstanding, you know? That was 1,400 years ago allowed. Today, this is the age of uh, TikTok, you know? And in the age of TikTok, it's one wife. But many girlfriends, okay? So, according to them, they deny the verses of the Quran. Okay, Allah says the man is like in charge, you know? The man is responsible in the house. Prophet says the woman should obey her, her husband. No, no, that you're misunderstanding, you misrepresent this. All of these scholars were misogynistic, women-hating individuals trying to control women. Yeah? And then they commit disbelief. How are they committing disbelief? By rejecting literally what the Quran and Hadith says. Obviously, this is the more extreme side, right? Of, of these doubts. So, now, what about... Now, this is the fitna of what? The shubuhat. Now, we have also the fitna of shahawat. Fitna of desires, right? So we mentioned two types. Now, the fitna of desires, or the fitna of, uh, sorry, the fitna of, yeah, desires, what is the most common sense that we see today? What is this most common sense that we see? The most important among them is what? The prayer. Muslims do not pray. The prayer that Allah Azza wa Jal have made Imad al Deen, the pillar of this religion. The religion of Islam, the pair of this religion. That the Prophet ﷺ have made the differentiator between believer and disbeliever. What differentiates a believer from a disbeliever is the prayer. This most important foundational thing in Islam, Muslims are not fulfilling anymore. Come to the masjid, it's empty. You, you see Eid, there is no place in the street to stand. So there is this number of Muslims, they exist. These people are Muslims, they come to pray Eid. Unless Kufar, they come to pray Eid with us or something. It's the same Muslims, right? It's your uncle, brother, sister. These are the people who are coming to pray for Eid. So why is that same group of people are praying this prayer Eid or Jumu'ah, which is a little less number or less number of people, but still many people coming. Why we don't see them in the rest of the prayers? Why we don't see them in the masjid when it's time to pray? Why is it only in the Eid prayer, the simple happy, you know, holidays, money, you know, dancing is okay. But when it comes to Salah, the rest of the year, no, the rest of the year, no. Or Ramadan, you see the masjid is full. Uh, some people use this term Ramadan Muslims, even though I don't agree with it. If someone comes to Allah in Ramadan, alhamdulillah. But they use that term for a reason. The term comes for what reason? It's the fact that you see these Muslims only in Ramadan, and you don't see them in the rest of the year. That's why they use that term Ramadan Muslim, because the fact is you only see them in Ramadan. So it's like the guy who only comes to you in, in a specific holiday, he becomes a person of that holiday, isn't it? Some relatives say you only see you in Eid, right? Some of the relatives, you only see them in Eid. So it's a holiday person, holiday person. That's why they started saying Ramadan Muslim. So this prayer that, that a, lot of, a lot of Muslims don't understand, like, and, and they need to keep in mind, and they need to understand, is the Prophet ﷺ said, the Prophet ﷺ said, Al-Ahdu alladhi baynana wa baynahum salah The difference between the believer and the disbeliever is a salah فَمَنْ تَرَكَهَا فَخَدْ كَفَرْ Who leaves it has committed disbelief. Prophet ﷺ said, look, this is not my words, yeah? I want you to pay attention. This is the speech of the Prophet ﷺ. Before you tell me, but it means this. Did the Prophet say it means this or that? Or is this the end of the hadith? This is the end of the hadith. Did the Prophet explain this hadith in another hadith? No. This is the statement that the Prophet ﷺ said. I'm saying to you the same statement the Prophet ﷺ said. If you say to me, you cannot say this without explaining it. How can the Prophet ﷺ say it without explaining it then? How comes the Prophet ﷺ said it without explaining what it means according to your understanding? He said it like it is. He said, ما بين العبد وما بين الكفر والشرك Between the, the, the servant of Allah. Between kufr and shirk is what? Tarku الصلاة. 
leaving the prayer. فمن تركها فقد كفر خلاص who leaves is complete disbelief. So between the abd, between the servant of Allah and leaving the prayer, it's shirk and kufr, becoming a kafir, becoming a mushrik is leaving the prayer. Someone comes, okay, but the ulama of later on, they said this and they said that, brother, they said this. Okay, brother. There are reports we have from the tabi'in. Yeah? Reports from the tabi'in. They said, reporting consensus, complete agreement upon the sahaba that the person who completely abandons the prayer is a disbeliever. Some people pray sometimes and leave sometimes, pray Jumu'ah, pray Eid. I'm not talking about these people. I'm saying someone completely abandons the prayer. Doesn't pray anymore at all. It's been one year, he's never prayed. Six months, seven months, eight months, few Eids, they pass by, they not pray. Now, the, 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 the tabi'i, what did he say? He says, Makana ashabu Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The companions of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They did not see anything as disbelief. They did not see any action. They did not see any action. That you leave it is disbelief except the prayer. You have Umar ibn Khattab saying, and many, many of the Sahaba just mentioned what Umar said. Umar ibn Khattab, he said, La hadha fil Islam. There's no portion of Islam liman tarak as salah for whoever leaves the prayer. Now someone comes to you and says, you know what the ulama later on, they said that means he does juhud. You know what juhud means? Juhud means that he says, I do not believe I have to pray. It's not an obligation in Islam to pray. They say, this is what the Prophet means. Did the Prophet say juhud in the hadith? No, but they say to you, you know what, the ulama, the madahib, the schools of thought, and they attribute certain things to Shafi and Malik, which is not as they attribute it. But they say, you know, this is how we understand it. Okay? And they say to you, you know what, the majority of the schools of thought, and it's true, the later scholars, the majority of the later scholars, after the Sahaba, have already agreed based on the statement that we mentioned. The later scholars, many of them have said, it's juhud. And juhud means to deny uh, that the prayer is an obligation. Okay, but we say to them, the, the tabi'i, they said, leave in an action. Leave in an action. They did not see an action that you leave, you leave, not you do juhud of, you leave. And the only, uh, there's no actions that you leave necessarily, you become a disbeliever, right? But you do juhud of, that means you say it's not an obligation. But okay, we say, no problem. Okay, let's accept your opinion, you know, because you know what, they would say to us, you know what, you're going to call majority of the ummah disbelievers now, and they say, okay, okay you want to you wanna take the opinion of the people, uh, which is the opinion I don't take personally, but you want to take the opinion of the ulama who said, you know what, it's actually juhud. You know what, so if he leaves it out of laziness, he's not a disbeliever. It's so only if he believes he doesn't have to pray. We say, okay, you know the most lenient opinion among these opinions is the opinion of Abu Hanif, right? The Hanafi school of thought. You know what that opinion says? If that person doesn't pray, he's put in prison. He is going to be put in prison and, and, and be told to pray now, to repent and pray, yeah? You need to pray. So this is the most lenient opinion. If you want to take the most lenient opinion, okay, at least follow it. Follow the most lenient opinion. You don't want to take the opinion that is a disbeliever, then take the most lenient opinion and show us the implementation of the opinion. So this... Pillar of Islam. That Allah Azza wa Jalla, He said in the Quran, He mentioned the, the description of the Anbiya, Prophets. And then He said, فَخَلَفَ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ خَلْفٌ And then they came after them. A generation. أَضَاعُوا الصَّلَاةَ They wasted the prayer. وَاتَّبَعُوا الشَّهَوَاتِ huh? فِتْنَ أُفْ شهوات. They followed their desires. فَسَوْفَ يَلْقَوْنَ غَيَّ Then they certainly will have غَيْ And غَيْ is the liquid that comes from the people of hellfire. You know, the liquid that comes out of them, that person will, will drink it. According to Abdullah ibn Abbas. Allah Azza wa says in the Quran, فَوَيْلُ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ Woe be to those who pray. Little one people don't pray, yeah? فَوَيْلُ لِلْمُصَلِّينَ Woe be to, and while here, Abdullah ibn Abbas, he says it's a valley in Jahannam, right? And then and the other opinion, that it is وَعِيدٌ شديد. It is a very harsh warning from Allah Azza wa He says to those who pray, Pray sometimes and leave some prayers or delay the prayers until uh, the time comes out or all, all, any of these things. But they pray. So imagine the person who doesn't pray at all. But you have the Muslims today leaving completely this prayer, right? They don't pray. They leave the prayer. You have people committing zina. People committing zina. There are people committing zina through marriage. Do you know how they're committing zina through marriage? They are marrying people that are not lawful to them. So it's not marriage in Islam. They're committing zina. They go to women in the West, and marry these women, and they say they're Christian women. Allah, did Allah Azza wa Jal allow the Muslim to marry a Christian or a Jew? Yes or no? Huh? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Okay, so Allah Azza wa Jal allowed the Muslim to marry a Christian. So why, why am I talking about that? Allah Azza wa Jal have put two conditions. 
The, without these two conditions, your marriage is not permissible. Where did Allah put it in the same verse that He allowed you to do? Open Surah Al Ma'idah, verse 5, the same verse. Huh? Allah says, Well, Muhsanatu. Huh? After He said, Uhillakum has been uh, permissible, made permissible for you. He said, Well, What does Muhsana mean? Muhsana in the Arabic language means the chaste, pure woman. So the woman either has to be a virgin or she has repented if she done something in the past and she does not sleep around with anyone. She does not do these things. She's, and we have evidence. She's repented now. She doesn't do these things, right? Because you know there are Christian women that actually preserve their chastity. There are women where they're like, uh, you can count them probably on your hand in every city. But there are Christian women who like tend to do that. They exist. But they're certainly nowhere near even close to be the majority. So she has to be chaste. Or, as we said, a virgin or chaste. This is what Muhsana means. And then he said, Mina ladina utul kitab. She believes in her book. She's given the book. She believes in the scripture. You come to the woman of today. Are you Christian? Yes. Do you believe in the Bible? No, 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 no. I don't, I don't follow these things. Why are you Christian then? Do you believe Jesus is God? No, I don't follow religion. Religion has been made by men. But you, what do you mean Christian? Yeah, my father, I was baptized when I was 10. You know, He put me in the water. and Allah. So do you believe in the book? You have similar values to what we... No, 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 no. I don't believe in religion. But quote, unquote, I'm Christian. So they go, they marry these women. And I give an example of the child. Remember the child? Seven-year-old child? This woman was the same. I asked her, do you believe in the Bible? No. So he's effectively not married there. He's committing zina. Under Islamic Sharia rules, this is not marriage. Because that woman is an atheist. That woman is an atheist, deist, agnostic. She's not a believer. Yeah? So... They think they have married, I mean, and you've got women as well. So we, we talked about the men now, yeah? This is because women as well have a big problem there. So I don't think it's just the women, yeah? Sorry, it's, not, it's just the men. It's the women as well. So the men have this, this problem now, right? The women, what problem do they have? The women have the problem of completely marrying kuffar now. Kuffar, atheist, agnostic, Christian, Jew, it's not permitted for them. Nowhere in the Quran is it permitted for women to marry, even from the Jews or the Christians. It's not permitted. It's not permissible. Allah has not allowed the woman to do that. Allah explicitly prohibits that in the Quran, chapter 2. Yeah? Allah says, well, abdu A slave, a believing slave is better than a, a, a mushrik. Allah, Allah says in, in, uh, in, uh, in the Quran as well, in Surah Al-Mumtahana. What does he say? فَلَا تَرْجِعُهُنَّ إِلَى الْكُفَّارِ Do not return them to the kuffar. لَا هُنَّ حِلٌّ لَهُمْ They're not permissible for them. وَلَا هُمْ يَحِلُّونَ لَهُمْ And they're not permissible for them. Can, you, can it be more clear than this? This is like the sun. If you can see the sun, this is the sun in front of your eyes. But the women, they still go. I find the woman coming from somewhere in Asia, in Indonesia, Malaysia, or whatever it is, Thailand. She's coming out. Muslim, you are Muslim, Muslim. And he's Muslim? No, no. no but how are you together? And you come with babies, pushing them with the trolley. And, yeah, subhanAllah. And you, you want to think how this woman lives with, it, with someone like this. How does she live? Because that man comes in the end of the night drunk. That man... When she's Ramadan, she wants to fast. If she fasts, Allah A'lam. She fasts, she wants to fast, he wants to have intercourse. He doesn't care whether you are Muslim or not Muslim, can I have intercourse? He wants to have intercourse. Why is he going to wait a full month for you? He doesn't care. His children, he's teaching them his values of drinking alcohol and going to the clubs and bars. SubhanAllah, you don't know how she lives with someone like this. They even, they don't want to talk about things which are be offensive. You know, to do with wudu and uh, Muslim. We don't want to even go to that extent. But imagine there. How do they live with someone like this? How do you live with someone like this? Subhanallah. And then. This is the marriage through zina. And then there is the normal zina. I can't tell you. I cannot tell you honestly. In the, in the amount I've been doing that. I cannot tell you the number of. Uh, boyfriend and girlfriend that I've seen. That one Muslim and one is not Muslim. Get Muslim girl and a non-Muslim boy. Or a non-Muslim boy. I cannot tell you how many I saw. And every time I see, until this day, I get angry. I, it doesn't matter how many times I see, I get angry. I do. I, I can't control myself. Especially when it's a sister. I get more angry. And I'm like, subhanAllah, like, if these are the Muslims I'm seeing on a day-to-day, what's going on here? Boyfriend, girlfriend, this and that. And like, it's as if it's like, what is the difference between a believer and a disbeliever? What is the distinction? If we're going to live... Effectively, a very similar like life, then what is the difference between us? Why are you you're using that title Muslim for yourself? Where is that Islam? And then you have other problems. You have Muslims. It comes to riba. Ah, riba. People don't like to hear about riba, is it? 
mortgage, student loan, credit card, uh, crypto, stocks. You know, I don't want to list as long, yeah? I don't want to go into that long, long list. Brother, but you're living in the West and you're using the bank. Okay, brother, I'm, I'm forced to use the bank for, for debit cards. Got no choice for work or to be able to do anything in this country. You need to have a debit card. So it is necessity. And Allah said in the Quran, and he, فصل لكم ما حرم عليكم in Surah Al-An'am, verse 119, that he stipulated for you that which is haram, except that which becomes a necessity. So I'm doing something halal because it's a necessity. It becomes halal. And I hate it in my heart. I'm not doing it willingly. But you going and dealing with interested usury and buying, uh, doing mortgages and these different things, this is not equal. This is an, a choice you're making. Nobody is forcing you. You can rent a house and live in a house. No one is forcing you to, to get a mortgage. No one is telling you to stay in the streets. It's not a necessity. But you have the Muslims, and they don't understand. Subhanallah, ya akhi, wallahi. The only the verse that you see in the Quran, Allah has I don't know how you can read this verse and deal with interest in I Wallahi, I never understood this. Allah Azza wa Jal says, Ya ayyuhal ladheen amal, oh you who believe, taqu Allah wa dharu ma baqiya min al-riba. In kuntu mu'mineen. Fear Allah. Fear Allah. And leave that which remains from your interest. Repent from interest. Leave interest. If you're believers. And then Allah Azza says, فَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا If you do not do. فَأَذَنُوا بِحَرْبٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ Prepare yourselves to be in war with Allah and His Messenger. Ya Akhi, subhanAllah. Do you understand what this means? Do you understand that you're worried about Israel and this and And USA. And you're committing war with Allah and His Messenger. فَأَذَنُوا بِحَرْبٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ For what reason? For hubbu dunya He had a disease of his ummah. Hubbu dunya wa karahitu al Worshipping money. Your, your, your Lord, your maker, is money. You go into war against Allah and his messenger. Yeah, he credit card, no problem. You know what? I'm going to just use it. And mortgage, you know, you know, Allah is forgiven, merciful man. What are you talking about? You don't know. Allah is just forgiven. You know, if your sins reach the sky, and Allah will forgive. This is the only thing they know. Okay, but is this verse in the Quran too? Yeah, 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 but if Allah Azza wa Jalla, you know, he forgives sins. But are, are the, Allah says he punishes you in the Quran. Yeah, yeah, but, but you don't focus on that. Extremist man. Why are you focusing on these verses and hadith? Just Allah is forgiven and merciful. But isn't the same Allah is the one who's telling you the other verses? Yeah, yeah, but he's forgiven and merciful. Shh, shh, don't talk to me. Don't judge me. Huh? Don't judge me, yeah? <laughs> Judging, you know, people who go to hell are those who judge. Don't want you to judge me. Yeah? Probably uh, my heart is clean and better than you, Allah knows. So don't judge me. I might be uh, committing all of these sins, but I'm better than you. My heart is clean, pure like the white. Even though Allah Azza wa Jal and Prophet Azza wa Sallam says to you, when you commit a sin, you have a nukta to a black dot, until your heart becomes black. But his heart is white. This guy is the exception to the rule. And don't judge me. Okay, but Umar al-Khattab said you can judge the people as a parent. And he said we judge today and the Prophet Azza wa Sallam judged. So can we judge? No, 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 you don't judge me. No, judging is... Where is this coming from? Liberalism. Do whatever, yeah, uh, as long as I'm doing it, I'm okay, you okay, uh, leave me alone. Liberalism. Okay? Everyone focus on his own life. The me, 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 me side of things. Right? So, these diseases, do they stop there? No. We've got other diseases when it comes to sins. People, alcohol, weed, you know, and weed and alcohol is the same thing, by the way, yeah? I don't want anyone to think it's a difference. They both intoxicate. Whatever intoxicate is khamr. Whatever intoxicate is khamr in Islam. Whether it's, do you drink it or you don't drink it? You swallow it, you take it in a pill, you put it in your arm, I don't care. It's still considered alcohol. In fact, uh, Shaykh al-Islam ibn al-Qayyim, he said it's more severe. It's worse than, than alcohol, he said. You have alcohol and you have weed. And you read the hadith that the person, you know what, you commit certain sins, you're not a believer when you're committing that sin, when you're drinking the alcohol, and you're not going to drink the alcohol of, of, uh, of the afterlife, and you're going to be uh, punished in hellfire, and you'll drink liquids of hellfire because you drink alcohol. And all of these hadith, Allah. and the prayer is not accepted for 40 days. It's a very important point I need to, uh, to point out here. When the, the hadith says that the prayer is not accepted 40 days for the person who drinks alcohol, that does not mean the person doesn't pray. That does not mean the person doesn't pray. That means the reward is invalid in that prayer. You don't get rewards. It's not accepted. Acceptance is rewards. But the obligation is still there. You still have to pray. 
And this is the, a message I'm giving to everyone, anyone who, who does smoke weed or drink alcohol. Pray. Pray. Why do you pray? Allah says in the Quran, Inna salata tana al wal munkar. The prayer forbids you from evil, forbids you from munkar. The thing which will save you from this drinking is the prayer. So don't leave the cure. Don't leave the, the cure of your problem and then have alcohol and weed and this and say my prayer is not accepted. No, your prayer is not accepted means there's no reward. But the obligation is there. And that obligation and you fulfilling the obligation, eventually with Allah's help, He might help you. And you stop that sin that you're doing. And then you have, the last thing I want to talk about is the music. Yeah? Mm. Mm. Music now, is music haram? No, no, brother, there's a disagreement. My uncle, he said, okay, brother, the you know, Prophet has said, no, 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 my uncle, my nephew, my brother, yeah, the hadith is clear, the Sahaba said, no, 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 you know, the scholar lived somewhere in the world, sometime in the world, hundreds of years ago, he said, it's okay. So, why are people struggling with music? People are struggling with music because the Quran is not in their heart. The Quran is not in their heart. Islam is not in their heart. Sheikh al-Islam al-Qayyim, what did he say? He said in his Nuniya, he has a very beautiful pieces of poetry, right? Uh, it starts with Sama'aka in Arata Sama'a Dayak al Ghina and Hadi al Hani. You can listen to, you can read this few uh, poetry pieces, like they influenced me a lot when I read them. And then he said in the end, very beautiful statement. He said, Hubbul Kitabi, loving of the Book of Allah, Hubbu al Hani al Ghina, and to love the music. في قلب عبد in a heart of a servant لا يجتمعاني they cannot gather together in one heart there's not enough space for you to love the Quran the book of Allah to know the Quran the book of Allah and to know music at the same time those people who listen to music uh, tell them okay tell me about this album they will tell you the name of the artist when she died when she lived you know what the, the, her album this album is unreleased but I listen to this album you know I know this music here that no one else heard you know that, okay you ask them do you know Quran Quran I know Fatiha Alhamdulillah Said Fatiha in the prayer. Anything else, brother? Yeah, Qul Wallahu Ahad, man. What are you talking about? Memorizing the Quran. You memorize anything else, brother? No, I, I no, Akhi. Akhi is good. Khalas is enough, you know, for what you're fighting for your prayer. Do you know the tafsir of the Quran? Have you read the tafsir before? No. Do you know the description of the verses? Of the, do you know the life of the Prophet? No. Do you know the names of the surahs even? No, no, no. How many surahs in the Quran? Some people, they don't know. How many surahs? If you ask some people today, the, chapter, the smallest chapter in the Quran, they don't know. The biggest verse in the Quran, which is very basic things. Many people, they don't know. But they would know the album that is unreleased and the name and what, which year it was, why it was not unreleased. And they will tell you the whole story. But the verses of Allah, no. It's not there. And they will try to argue their best to criticize any hadith which speaks about that, any statement that speaks about that. You find the Quran is clear. Ya Akhi, subhanAllah. It cannot be clearer. وَاسْتَفْزِزْ مَنِ اسْتَطَعْتَ مِنْهُمْ بِصَوْتِكَ and then Allah says, uh, allure them with your voice. And then you have the self, all of them, saying it's music. Ghina, 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 ghina. Clearly. وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَشْتَرِي لَهُ الْحَدِيثِ And from the people who does لَهُ الْحَدِيثِ What is لَهُ الْحَدِيثِ? That's why the, the music instrument is called لَهُ أَدَوَاتُ اللَّهُ It's called أَدَوَاتُ اللَّهُ Right? أَدَوَاتُ اللَّهُ is what? Is musical instrument. Same word there. لَهُ Right? So these أَدَوَاتُ اللَّهُ that the people use, Allah is saying that from the people who uses this, these things to misguide the people from, uh, from uh, the path of Allah. Not my understanding, brother. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Mujahid, Abdullah ibn Abbas. Who do you want? Ata. The people who did, uh, given us the land from the Prophet ﷺ, Turjuman of the Quran is telling you this is ghina. This is music, musical instrument. Then you find the, the uh, hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, which is like explicit, clear. By the way, there's a book Sheikh Al Albani, rahimahullah. It's about Tahrimu uh, Alat al Tarab, or something close to that. If you Google it, you'll find it. And he has like a hadith there, many a hadith that shows you that musical instruments are haram. They talk about, for example, drums and certain instruments. Explicit a hadith, if you want to check that. But there's a clear hadith in Bukhari. In Bukhari, the most authentic book of hadith with the agreement of all the Muslims. That hadith, what does it say? Prophet says, لَيَكُنَنْ مِنْ أُمَّتِي أَقْوَامُ And they're fulfilling. Look, they are fulfilling. The, this is a funny thing, subhanAllah. The people are fulfilling the prophecy of the Prophet ﷺ. Prophet ﷺ. They're unknowingly fulfilling it. They're rejecting the hadith. They're fulfilling the prophecy. They're saying the hadith is false, but they're fulfilling the prophecy of the hadith. The hadith is saying there will be a group of my people. 
They will do istihlal, istihlal, meaning it's haram and they will say it's halal. Of khamr, alcohol, hair, zina, harir, silk for men, because it's haram, and ma'azif, musical instrument. And these people, they say to you, to do what? There's this agreement, it's halal. This agreement is there, they say, or they don't say, they say. They fulfill the prophecy of the Prophet They reject the hadith. No, we don't accept this hadith. You know what? It's mu'allaq. Even though they never know in their life what mu'allaq is and they never study the science of hadith. But today they become scholars. They heard it somewhere. This is mu'allaq. Mu'allaq means Bukhari put it without a chain. Okay, Bukhari put it without a chain. Is there a chain for the hadith? Or there is no chain? Uh, we don't know. But it's mu'allaq, therefore I'm not going to say. Al-Hafid ibn Hajj al-Asqalani. In his book, Taghliq al-Ta'liq, he put a chain for it. The same hadith is in Ahmad, in Musnad Ahmad, in multiple books of hadith, with authentic narrations, authentic chains. When Bukhari mentioned it, Bukhari already knows its authenticity. He doesn't necessarily need to mention it to you. And he narrated it from his teacher. There are certain mu'allaqat that Bukhari mentions, but Sigat al that are authentic. But no, they don't know any of this, and they don't care to know. What they care to know is, what, yeah, I don't care, but a sahaba disagree. You know what? Some sahabi said this, some sahabi said this. No, no, no one disagreed about this issue. You're not going to find a single companion who disagreed with Abdullah ibn Abbas or Ibn Mas'ud when they talked about the interpretation of the verses that I told you. Open the tafsir. You're not going to see them saying, no, this person is wrong. That's a different, that's a wrong interpretation. But they become all scholars because of their desires, yeah? Uh, music is okay, brother. Listen to music. Yeah, don't be uh, extremist, yeah? Stop being extremist. You listen to music. These are the diseases we have in this ummah. Okay. We know the diseases now. What are the cures of these diseases? The cures of these diseases, they're essentially the first and most important thing to protect yourself from every disease, all of these diseases. The shubhat and the shahawat is the aqidah. Do you know what aqidah is? A lot of people don't know. Say, what is aqidah? A lot of people, they hear this term, but they don't know what aqidah is. So you have to have the correct aqidah. But why is this aqidah? No? Why is it aqidah, aqidah, aqidah? You just hear the tawheed, aqidah. It's all, everything, you, you only know how to say these words. But most people don't, don't even know the, the meaning. Aqidah means the pillars of Iman, believing in Allah, His books, His messengers, the revelation. Yeah? Al-Qadr. These six articles and three other things, which the scholars add, these are the, the issue of the Sahaba, because the disagreement happened of Shia, between us and the Shia. So they put it in the books of Aqidah, our position on the Sahaba. And then the issue of Iman, because of the Khawarij and the Murji'ah, is deviated six, in early Islam. So the, 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 the Salaf, they put these issues in Aqidah as well. And the issue of Imamah, leadership. Because of the Khawarij, they're saying Uthman, they did takfir on Uthman, Allah and killed it, and all of these issues, right? So these three mulhaqat with the six articles of faith, this is the Aqidah of, of a Muslim. You as a Muslim need to know your Aqidah. When I say to you, who's Allah? You need to be able to tell me who's Allah. The names and attributes of Allah, you need to be able to tell me the names and attributes of Allah. Not all of them to say them by name, but to understand them. To understand what we affirm from the names of Allah, what we negate, what we accept. How do we understand these names and attributes? The meaning of these names and attributes of Allah Azza wa Jal. That worship is only singled out to Allah Azza wa Jal. You don't worship other than Allah. You don't call upon the dead people for helping, helping you when they're not even there. They cannot hear you. These things, these this issues, this is the foundation of your religion. To know what does believing in Allah Azza wa Jal mean. And then to know... What does it mean to believe in prophets? Are these prophets ma'asum or not ma'asum, for example? What is the isma for these prophets? Right. Uh, these prophets are messenger. What does it mean to be a prophet or a messenger? What is the difference between a prophet and a messenger? Are they the same level? These things, these issues to do with the prophet. The books. Are these previous books corrupted or not corrupted? Some Muslims today believe that we believe the Bible is mentioned in the Quran and the Bible is preserved. Some people think like this. Wallahi, they do. They think that the Quran affirms the Bible. If you know the Bible, the word Bible is nowhere to be found in the Quran. But you know what they find? They think we believe in the Bible. Because they've not, they've not studied. They don't understand what is believing in the books and the tahrif of the books and the levels of these books. And is the, are they all equal? What is written? Some of them written by Allah. Like the Torah was written by Allah. Allah wrote it with his hand. The Hadith. Allah. التورات وخط التورات in the Hadith. There's a mention that Allah Azza wa التورات بيده. He wrote the Torah with his hand. So the Hadith is saying. So some of them have been written directly by Allah. Some of them is verbatim, the speech of Allah Azza wa Jalla, like the Quran. We need to know what is, what is the Quran. Okay, is the Quran, does the Quran have contradictions? Is it preserved? How is it preserved? Why are these other books uh, changed? These things, where are the verses that says this book, these books are changed? Believe in the last day. 
Because when you believe in the last day and you read the descriptions of hellfire and you read the descriptions of Jannah, you wouldn't be daring to do the things that you did. You wouldn't dare to transgress against the maharam of Allah against the boundaries of Allah Because you understand what are the consequences of doing that. They say, you know what, there's an example that the friend told me once, and it's, it's a beautiful example because it, it fits into this idea. He said, if you know your boss, you know, you go to work, you have a boss. If the boss is lenient, you know, you slack in the job, you, you go here and there a few hours, you eat the drink, you're not working properly. But if you know your boss is a guy who's like, if he sees anything wrong, he's going to fire you. You're going to behave account accordingly, right? You'll be like this in the job. So if you do not know, and walillahi al-mathal al-a'la, for Allah is the highest of examples in comparison, obviously. But if you don't know Allah, what you know of Allah is how you're going to behave. So those people, the only thing they know about Allah Azza wa Jal is what? He's merciful if your sins reach the sky. All of these, you know, compassionate imams. And today, they tell you compassion every day, day and night. Compassion only is nothing else in the deen of Allah. They, Muslims have absorbed this. And based on that, they think Allah is only merciful. Do whatever you like. But if they were to understand that Allah Azza wa Jal in the Quran for a hikmah, for a, for a illa, for a reason... In multiple verses, not one. He, he gathers punishment and reward, to, uh, and to reward together. In Allah shadeed al-iqabi wa in Allah ghafoon rahim This is one verse. One verse. Just telling you these two things together so you understand. In Allah shadeed al aqabi Allah is severe in punishment. Wa in Allah ghafoon rahim And Allah is forgiven and merciful. Don't take one and leave the other. Don't take one and leave the other. Do what Shaykh al-Islam al qayyim said. Muslim is like a bird. He has two wings. Hope and fear. You're in middle. If you lean too much into one, it's a problem. If you lean too much into the other, it's a problem. So of course, not everything is fear also. You cannot despair from Allah's mercy. The only the, the, the disobedient, dis disbelieving people are the ones who despair from Allah's mercy completely. We don't despair from Allah's mercy. But in the same time, we know that Allah has boundaries and those boundaries are to be respected. And we have to do our best and this is how we obtain Allah's mercy. Okay? You, you believe the last day, you understand the last day, the hisab. The mawqif, what's going to happen to me when I stand before Allah? The qantara, what, what is this the qantara, what is the sirat, what is going to happen when I walk there? These things when you visualize, you put in your mind as a Muslim, your behavior becomes in accordance to what you know. Yawm al-akhir, qadr. Believe in the qadr. Allah, if you believe in the qadr, brothers and sisters, you will not have issues in your life. You know anxiety, depression, all of these things, you're not going to have them. Wallahi, if you believe in the qadr the, the right way, I don't think any of you will have depression in his life. It's impossible. The minute you understand that everything that takes place, Allah Azza wa Jal is the one who chose it. And Allah only chooses good for the believers. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. Only choose good for the believers. And that is either a test for me, or removing my sins so I'm not punished in the Akhirah, or elevating my status. And this is Allah is the one who chose it for me. So when I'm upset, I'm upset because Allah chose a good thing for me. I see it bad, yeah? But no, 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 no. Allah chose a good thing for me and I'm upset. How could you get upset or get anxiety if you understood this concept? Wallahi, it's impossible. You couldn't, you can. If you truly, if you truly, truly have the concept of qadr in your heart and understand what qadr means, you can't. Allah says, لِكَيْ لَا تَأْسَوْ عَلَى مَا فَاتَكُمْ So you do not regret that which you missed. Because you knew you could not have gotten it. Qadr says you could not have gotten it. What you've gotten is what you have gotten. And you do not become arrogant and boastful with what you have because Allah is the one who gave it to you. Ah, it's like, not like what Qarun says. I was given it up because of my, I'm a businessman, you know. My knowledge, and my, I'm always able to get this. That's why I'm rich, you know. I'm not like these idiots who don't know what to do. Allah is the one who gave you that money. There are people smarter than you and they don't have the money. There are people more intelligent than you and they don't have the money. So once you understand this concept of Qadr, it's very important. Wallahi, very, very important. And now, obviously, the issues of the mulhaqat as well, about Iman, what does believe mean? What it means to be a believer? Because we're just talking now about those, my heart is clean, yeah? If those people understood what Iman is, and the Iman is three things. Statement that you say with your tongue. Shahada, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. And the belief in the heart, huh? the one that they like only. Yeah? And the actions. And that the actions is a part of Iman. There's many ahadith on that. Multiple hadith. They just read the beginning of Surah al anfal where Allah mentions the deeds, and then He says that this is Iman. Allah says, "Ulaika wal mu'minun haqqa." Those who establish prayer and do this. wal mu'minun haqqa. Those are the true believers. And Allah mentioned deeds, actions that you take, you do with your limbs. Prophet ﷺ said, 
the Iman is Bid'un wa Sittuna or Bid'un wa Sab'una? Two narrations. There are 70 odd or 60 odd things, right? Branches. And he says one of them is what? Removing the other from the tariq. Removing the, is that an action or no? Action. You remove harmful thing from the road. That's Iman. So if the people understood that, then they will understand. You cannot say my heart is clean and I'm a believer, I'm good. When you're not praying, we're committing zina, committing all of these deeds, right? So the people, wallahi, if they understood, because a lot of people, they want to counter the diseases in the ummah, like liberalism, feminism, and that, with rationality, which I've been giving you some of it today, right? In the beginning of this talk, I've given you rationality for why these things are problematic. But the true disease is that the ummah are empty in their hearts. That's why it can be filled with rubbish and garbage. If it was full, it will never soak anything. Like either Sheikh Islam uh, Ibn Qayyim or Ibn Taymiyyah mentioned this example. This is like, like you have this thing that you used to wash, to wash your clothes, I remember, what is the name of it? You know when it's full with water, right? The sponge, yes. The heart is like a sponge. If you fill it with water, can you, when you pour more water, is it going to absorb anything? Or the water is going to go? It's not going to absorb, right? I have absorbed everything, absorbed all the water in it. Or a glass, if you fill it, glass is full. So when you get all of these problems that people have tried now to inf infect your heart with, your heart is full, full of Iman, full of Aqidah, full of the Quran, full of Hadith. It's not going to seep through. But because the Ummah's heart is empty, the right way to deal with these problems is to teach them their own religion, because they understand what they, why they believe what they do. And that's why I'm saying to you, a question that you should ask each, each one of you should ask himself. Why are you a Muslim? Huh? Is it because you're born a Muslim? That's what the Kuffar of Quraysh said. That's what we found our forefathers upon. Why if their forefathers they know nothing, they were not people of intellect or knowledge. So why are you a Muslim? Why are you sitting here? Why are you a Muslim? You should, the answer should be, I'm a Muslim because Islam is the truth. Islam is the haqq. And say the truth from your Lord. Wishes to believe, let him believe, and wishes to disbelieve, let him disbelieve. Liberalism, no, 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 no. And finish the verse. We have prepared with the disbelievers a hellfire. Yeah, that will surround them. The fire will surround them. So it's Allah is not saying who wish to believe, believe, and you wish to disbelieve. This. No, 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 no. Allah is a warning. It's like when you have a child, you know, if you have a child, as an example, if you have a child, and then you say, yeah, okay, do it, watch the TV. No, do it. Is, is that mean you take him to watch the TV? No, you're not telling him to watch the TV. But you're warning him. So Allah is warning. He's saying, yeah, okay, you want to disbelieve? Do you disbelieve? But this is the outcome. So, once you understand this is the haqq, then we need to know why we are Muslims. Why is the evidence for Islam? Why do you believe the Prophet Muhammad is the messenger of Allah? Why is the Quran the true message from God? Like the Quran cannot be imitated. The prophecies of the Prophet وسلم, his life. Many evidences. But you need to know these things. You need to absorb it. And I don't want to, uh, like, subhanAllah, it's not boost, a boostful thing, but I want to say this. Even if you, you were to bring me a hundred of the smartest atheists today and they stand here and whatever they say, it's not going to change the fact that I know this is from Allah. Why? Because the amount of evidences that I saw, it becomes impossible for this not to be the haqq. Whatever a lame human being no matter how smart he thinks he is when he came from a sperm drop, he thinks he's so smart. Whatever he utters is not going to influence that which I have as a foundation which is unshakable. It is unconceivable, impossible for the things that Islam put forward as evidence, not for it to be the truth. It's impossible. Just like you see the sun. If I bring 100 atheists, would they convince you there's no sun? Would, they, would any of you be convinced? Would they convince you that we're not speaking right now? Would they convince you? Allah says, وَإِنَّهُ لَحَقٌ This is true. Just like you're speaking like this. Same way you know for a fact that you're speaking, you're speaking right now. Islam is the truth. This Quran is haqq. Yeah, not probably is haqq like some people say, I hear that. No, no, no. It is the haqq certainty. وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ بِآيَاتِنَا يُقِنُونَ They are certain in our verses. Yeah? This is yaqeen. We have yaqeen that this deen is from Allah Azza wa Jalla. From a knowledge level. But there's levels of yaqeen. The second level is to see. Aynul yaqeen. We've not seen. And haqqul yaqeen is to experience. We've not experienced jannah and nar and jinn. But we are at the first level. We have yaqeen. Ilmul yaqeen. Knowledge for certainty. This is from Allah. 
So this is what you need. You need to know why you're a Muslim. This is the only thing that is going to help you to avoid these things. The other things that you would need to do to avoid some of uh, these issues that we see today is, for example, to... Like each of these things that we mentioned that people find problematic, there's ways to fix many of them. For example, you find leaving the prayer, committing zina, and weed, and these things, and listening to music, you find these things, they have one commonality. You know what that one commonality is? They have bad friends. People have bad friends, bad companions, bad surroundings, bad environments. That's why all of you probably know the hadith of Darahib, right? Hadith of Darahib who killed... 99 souls. You heard this hadith, right? A very popular, famous hadith. And that rahib, what does he say? Or the, the, to the person, the person of knowledge, he says to him, leave the village. Leave that bad place that you're in. Why? Because your environment affects you. Your surroundings affect you. Your friends affect you. Prophet, alayhi salatu salam, he said, Ah, I want you to understand this hadith. Do not befriend except a believer. Do not befriend except a believer. So when you bring this Michael and he says, my friend, no, no, Habib. Do not befriend except a believer. He can be your colleague, person you know. We're not saying be bad to them, be good to them, everything. Of course, there is bird. Allah commands you to be good to them, right? But he's not your friend. Friend is that which you tell your secrets influences your behavior, your understanding, you spend most of your time with, that's a friend. Cannot be someone who is most of the time in the club, in the bar, listening to music. Where are you going to be? You're going to be in the masjid and in the club, in the bar, are you friends? I don't know, either, you know, unless you know you can time travel or your two personalities are one. That cannot happen. So, Prophet ﷺ said, do not be friends except a believer. And he mentioned many hadith that maybe some of you know, some of you don't know. For example, the Al-Mar'u ala deeni khalili. You're upon the religion of your friend. If your friend is an atheist, you come tell me I'm a Muslim practicing. Prophet said, you're upon the religion of your friend. Look who you're taking as a, as a friend. And the Prophet says, Khalil, you khalil. You know what the word yukhalil means in the Arabic language? Is when something sips through something else. You understand? Because these ideas and behaviors of your friends, they literally sip through you and your ideas and your beliefs. That's why you find them saying you're the sum of the five people you hang out with. They say these things. All the time you hear the, them saying this, this example. Because it's true, who you spend your time with is going to influence you. Some people are, can, can come and say, now, you know what, look, life is difficult for us, man, we live in the West. You know, everyone is like, bars, clubs, women walking by, and I, that is an excuse. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, did he have it more difficult or easier? Difficult or easier, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his companions, women were circulating the Kaaba completely naked. They have brothels and houses of committing zina and shirk. They were doing usury and interest. They were killing each other for the lamest things. Wars for tens of years for ridiculous reasons. Killing left and right. So whatever you see today in the community, there is nothing that, uh, that you have to they used to drink alcohol more than water. You know, the hadith, when alcohol became forbidden and they put it in, the roads were soaked. Can you imagine roads are soaked? Even today, probably, uh, roads were soaked from the alcohol. They used to drink it like water, you know? So anything of what you say was there. So what made those people, the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, be firm on the, what they believe? It was their aqid. It was them knowing what I told you a minute ago. Knowing for a fact, this is the haqq from Allah. It, it is irrelevant what people around me are doing. It is irrelevant how many women there, they try, even they come to you themselves, it does not matter. It is irrelevant who listens to music, day and night, that's irrelevant. I know this is the yaqeen, by yaqeen, by certainty I know this is the haqq. Therefore, I know I should behave based on that. I don't care how other people behave. They're not, um, they're not going to stand before Allah. I will stand before Allah. So, having friends it is the most important thing. Friends, having the righteous friends. The second thing I'm going to mention is the school. And the one thing I want to add on the righteous friends, right? We said this is the effect of a, of a bad friend on you. But the good friend, what is the effect? It's the opposite effect. Increasing your knowledge, calling you to prayer, reminding you Allah Azza wa Jalla. And on the Day of Judgment, the hadith says, people will say, oh Allah. They will say, oh Allah, we're not happy with, with our friends not being with us in general in the fire. Muslims, yeah, will be punished in the fire. And Allah will say, go take your friend. Shafa'a, you know, good friends you take, you can take you and me from the fire. Just being around good people, good companionship, can be a reason for you to be taken from the fire and, and enter Jannah instead of being punished in the fire. 
subhanAllah, know the importance of having good things. The second thing which briefly I want to say is taking your children to schools. Yeah? If you live in the West and you think, because you worship uh, your Abdul Dirham, like the Prophet said, you worship the Dirham, the money. You think that taking your, school, your children to school and ending up being atheist and agnostic in a mixed school where they teach them rainbow values, colorful values, right? Is more important than their akhirah, then you should not have children. I'm telling you, don't have children. You, you're only causing us more trouble. We have to deal with them. Stay without children, it's better. You're not helping. The Prophet ﷺ, when he said, Takatharu, like multiply, because he will show us often the day of judgment. Those children of yours are not going to be a part of them. So there's no point of multiplying if they're going to be with the other side. Yeah? We don't need you to multiply. Unless you're going to have, if you're going to have children, take the responsibility of your children. The school is not going to raise your kids. I have a friend, you know, he, he sends his children to school. He, he has his children in the West and then he want to go travel to a Muslim country. He says, I'm going to send them to school there. They're going to learn. I say to me, you think the school is going to raise your children? Muslim country or non-Muslim country? You think the school is going to raise your children? I know the biggest universities you can see, or let's say the biggest schools, like for example, mentioning Azhar in Egypt, one of the biggest Islamic schools. Children there, they watch pornography on their phones and, and they say the most bad, most vicious cursing words. Of course, they teach him good. I'm not saying the whole institution is bad. But we're saying these things are present. So to assume that if I take my child to Azhar or a good university or a good uh, Islamic, you know, he's going to learn. You are dreaming. Prophet ﷺ says, Kullukum ra'in. Each one of you is a shepherd. You will be asked upon your flock. It's your responsibility to teach your, your son. You will be asked. You have to have classes. You have to, in the home, at least one day a week, a story about companions. Teaching them their aqidah. Where is Allah Azza wa Jalla? Allah is above his arsh. Above. Be teaching them these things. I believe in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What is the shahada? What is iman? Teaching them these things. Like that seven-year-old. Yeah, I mentioned the story of the seven-year-old. They have to be like a seven-year-old, but in an Islamic way. Yeah? Same thing. Alhamdulillah. And there are people who do this. I have a friend, seven-year-old daughter. She almost going to finish the Quran. Memorizes a lot of the Quran. She's some of the, one of the smartest kids. May Allah mabad. So, we can do it. But we need to put the effort. So homeschooling your children, if you can homeschool your children, it is more important than taking your children to become atheists and agnostics and, and uh, uh, soldiers for the enemy, as I said. Literally. This is what you're taking them to do. So either you take them to an Islamic school, because there are Islamic schools. If you cannot afford it, you try to homeschool your kids. But there is no option in which you take your kids, you leave them in a kafir school, you don't pay them attention, and you expect them to become Sheikh al-Islam in Taymi. It's not going to happen, Habib. And don't come, they come, people come to me, a lot of people come to me, or they come to dua, they come to scholars, or they come to ulama, or they come to students, and all say, look, my son left Islam. No, 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 no. You made your son leave Islam. You didn't teach your son from when he was a baby, and when the end of the problem, 16, 17, 18, 18 years later, you want me to fix it. I mean, you know cancer. Cancer can be treated in the early stages. There's many treatments for cancer in the early stages. But once cancer sits through the rest of the body, you cannot deal with it anymore. So you don't leave your child for 16, 18 years being absorbing these things and then come later on when you have a problem. Oh, fix the problem. Go, go. I'm going to give him like the magic pill and he's going to become Shaykh al-Islam. No. It's not going to happen, brother. Take care of your children. Raise your children upon correct beliefs and foundations. Seek knowledge. Have good friends and companions. And inshallah, Allah Azza wa Jal will give you guidance. Look at the companions and the Prophet Sallallahu What they did, imitate it and do likewise. I ask Allah Azza wa Jal to bless everyone, you know, and forgive me for maybe, you know, it was a long talk, you know, for bearing with me, you know, and listening. May Allah Azza wa Jal uh, bless you all for coming and reward you. And inshallah, as I said, inshallah, is not the last time uh, in the Netherlands. And uh, I will end here, inshallah. So we can let you go, let you go home, inshallah. Uh, be with your families. Don't forget us in, in your dua, inshallah. Anything I say correct is from Allah. Anything I said wrong is from me and the shaitan. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.